Richard Valentine Selsey, the head of European residential research at the publicly listed real estate company Savills. His thoughts and views are in such high demand globally from retail investors, banks, and large institutions. For the last seven years at Savills, Richard has been at the forefront of the regularly anticipated property forecasts and data that determines investor confidence. As if he wasn't busy enough, Richard is also a revered guest speaker at property networking events, as well as providing publications for the likes of the BBC and a respected judge for property industry awards. Welcome to Magna Meets. Behind this podcast, we're a UK property investment consultancy that helps new and seasoned investors build their wealth through new build and off-band properties. This podcast welcomes guests from all different paths in property and the business world. We'll uncover their journey, challenges, successes, and industry truths. I'd be so grateful if you subscribe to this channel as it will help open the doors to more guests who have walked the journey you're currently on. Let's get into this episode. Welcome to another episode of Magna Meets, and I can't tell you how happy and excited I am, the team at Magna are, to have this this guest with us today. Um, you know that if you're in property and you don't reference Savills, you're you're not taken seriously. And we've got the man behind the European Residential Research Team, um, and Richard. It's an absolute pleasure to have you on. It's great to be here. Thank you very much. And before we get on to how you became the European Residential Research Head, mm-hmm. um, tell us a little bit about the background. Great. So I am um, born and raised in Newbury, um, spent most of my early, early life there um, before trucking off to Bristol to go to university, okay. where I thought I'd start off with maybe going down the um, IT computing route, did a year of computer science before I decided I didn't want to spend my life sat in a computer room um, coding all day. So I switched to doing politics, which kind of fed into my desire to like, understand what's going on, do a read, bit of reading, bit of research, to understand broader like, macro pictures of happening. Nice. So graduating in 2010 wasn't a particularly great time to be coming into the jobs market. Um, had no idea quite what I wanted to do. So did the usual thing, sending off two, 300 job applications, hearing back from none of them. Until I finally got a temporary job at Estates Gazette. Okay. And that was my first introduction to the property market and understanding that that's an industry I could work in. Uh, so joined their research team covering like, Greater London and the Southeast commercial property markets. Mm. So that was a lot of trawling through the internet, calling agents, trying to track deals and availability for offices, retail, industrial. Um, from that, kind of realized I enjoyed being in the property industry, walking around London, knowing what's going on, being able to point to buildings saying they're about to knock that down or do this with it. It was really, found really interesting and to see what's going on. Mm. Um, then got my first break into the residential market, moving over to Hamptons International. Stayed there for a short while before moving around to Christian and Wakefield, Jeddah, and then finally settling on Savills back in 2017. So nearly seven odd years now um, in Savills team. And, have been on the research side the entire time. I'm always interested to, to tap into the early years that that meant and make sense as to why you do what you do now. Um, research is very specific mm. and it takes a certain person to, to sort of really get into the nuts and bolts of information and, and, and dig out mm. dig out the truth. What was it that may have made sense at the, the earlier years? Um, as to where you are now. So I think going back, I had a couple of teachers at school who really kind of sparked my interest in the research side of things. So doing essays in the history department with politics where you're trying to dig out what's happening and kind of synthesize what you've seen and why it means something Mm. Uh, alongside the influence of my parents who both worked in that kind of of field that kind of pushed me into thinking, actually, I like reading about it, understanding something and trying to convey that back to someone. Mm. And so the research was a nice kind of perfect fit between the skill sets that I have and also the things that I enjoyed doing. Yes. And and anyone considering the research field, what does it take? It takes a keen mind and an inquisitive mind. Um, when we look for new analysts to join our team, we don't necessarily need someone that has the property knowledge because in many ways you can teach someone that relatively easily. Mm. What you do want is the right type of mindset and mind frame to be asking questions and trying to find out more and wanting to know why something's like that and knowing what you don't know and knowing when to say can you help me 
explain what this means or why does this do something that's kind of what we're looking for i think that's what makes a great research to that inquisitiveness um what does the role involve day to day for you so it's a mix um so it's probably 30 40 percent of my time is spent leading on the kind of thought leadership work so that's the publications that people will see on a website that get put up in the press um 10 15 percent of my time is probably spent presenting to clients both at large events like the baker street property meet we met at mm-hmm. uh, alongside individual presentations to banks and investors um and then we also do the rest of my time is probably spent doing bespoke consultancy mm. so as a research team we not only do the kind of thought leadership piece but also do specific paid work for clients when they're trying to understand what markets they should go into what they should be developing what they should invest in and that whole piece to try and understand what's going on in the market i've read a lot of those reports um and, and i wasn't joking earlier on when i said that you know your your quotes your stats aren't taken seriously if you don't mm. label the likes of savills how does that feel it's a really nice positive reinforcement that we're doing the right thing mm. and the fact that people do trust what we're saying yeah and that we do have that kind of cachet or the kind of confidence from the wider market that we aren't just saying things because that's what we should be saying to help our agents like the fact we have that kind of remit of being able to say what we actually think is going on in the market is quite a liberating piece but also brings with it a certain degree of responsibility to make sure that we are triple checking what we put out mm. and that if we do get something wrong holding our hands up and saying sorry guys we need to take it back this is actually what it should have been so you do you do get things wrong yeah, everyone will do at some point. Yeah. We are generally very, very good at catching it before it goes out. Mm. But every once in a while, something might slip through. But we are pretty much always there to say we've got it right. Give, give us an example of when it might have gone wrong. So I think sometimes it's some of the numbers you might see in a report. Mm. If you're reading through it, they it might change one to another. Then that's someone just mistyped in a number. Fine. So the broad thesis is always correct. It's a bit making sure that every time you go through it the right numbers are there i, I think in certainly in our sector which mm-hmm. is residential um buy to lets forecast property forecasts is a, is a hot one right yeah. everyone loves to quote you know how how much a market is going to grow over the next five years you see the sort of the, the sun in the clouds and, and all of that <laughs> stuff right um what goes into that and getting that right so that is actually probably one of our longest processes that we go through right. so we typically in a more stable market, we'll do that once a year. So we'll publish our forecasts in early November. Mm. We'll start that process probably around August, September time, okay. um, and go through a round of analysis looking at different metrics on both the sales and the rental markets to understand how things are moving, what's going on with the mortgage markets, what's going on with unemployment, mm. what's going on with the wider economy, what are interest rates going to do, what have house prices done to date, and then kind of feeding that through and sense checking testing different um, hypotheses against themselves mm. to come up with well, what actually looks plausible based upon the information data we've got um, and is very much the kind of big marquee event that we do every year yeah um, now with the market going through the flux we've seen in the last two years that has gone from being an annual event to probably checking every three to six months to make sure we're broadly on track and actually with that we've only just published an updated house price forecast. I noticed you revised it, right? Yeah, so when we did the analysis back in November with mortgage rates where they were, forecasts for the economy as they were, it looked like we were due to see house price falls again in 2024. But the market has surprised us yet again by showing that actually you've seen growth again mm. in the first three months of this year, meaning that to see the falls we were forecasting, you'd need to see significant falls we don't think would happen. So this is one of the times when we were like, the market's moved on enough that we can't stand behind the forecast we had in November. Mm. So it's incumbent on us to say, actually, like, we need to, rev- need to review this and revise this and say, this is actually what we're seeing now. Yeah, and, and that, again, feeds into credibility. Mm. You know, you're not, you're not sort of afraid to say, look, well, we're going to change tact here and, and go a different direction. Yeah. Um, is there a particular sector that underpins the direction of the property market? I think the major thing that's underpinning the direction of the market at the moment is what's going on with mortgage mar- in the mortgage market. Fine. So what, what are interest rates doing? Fundamentally, so I look after both the wider residential rental market as well as kind of institutional section of that. Mm. 
and all of it basically at the moment is underpinning when when is the bank going to do the first base rate cut right is it going to be june is it going to be august is it going to be september and that is the fundamental trigger point for unlocking a lot more activity going forward mm. and we spoke we spoke off camera uh, briefly about the macro factors the wider factors a, a lot of investors will go into this somewhat blinkered a lot of times in you know looking at the local patch and looking at where the property is close to and and so on and so forth um factors that aren't considered mm. that can aid investors what would you what would you recommend so yeah that that is obviously a really important part because it's as the TV show, Kirsten Phil shows location, location, location is a yeah. really key part. Mm -hmm. But I think it's couching that in what is going on in that town. Like, is the economy going well? Is there new employment coming in? Mm. What are those other factors that are going kind to of feed into the longer term stability of growth in that place? So while it's difficult, because obviously you only have a limited amount of time in the day, being able to just to keep an eye on what is going on more broadly and kind of what are the local councils looking to do in terms of investment and what what's going on the high street, that sort of thing. Mm. Is this the sort of market you're going to see continued demand coming into? It's kind of really important factors to just to couch the wider piece in terms of the way you're looking at. You have one camp, Richard, that will say, do you know, information, information, whatever, because if they're in this for the long haul, does it really matter? Would you, would you disagree with that? Um, I wouldn't necessarily completely disagree, but I think burying your head and thinking it'll, but it'll all be all right in the end yeah. isn't necessarily going to be what's going to happen forever. Mm. And I think more and more now is looking at what is actually going to happen in this small area and understanding that in the near term rather than just, oh, it'll be fine in 15 years, everything will be better. Yeah, yeah. Because you can get caught out. You can be in a place where suddenly employment leaves and you're stuck with the wrong place. True. So just being aware of that. And you don't have to go all the way down into the depths of every bit of data. And I think there is a risk nowadays that there is too much data in, at mm -hmm. times. Mm -hmm. And you can get a bit blinded by too much data, too much analysis, without being able to say, well, what's the important bit to look at and focus on those? Absolutely. And it's stripping it back, keeping it almost simple, stupid to a certain extent. Um, you know, we speak to investors on a daily basis, and there is a, a, a large proportion that are in the research phase, but have been in the research phase for many, many years. Um, and there's got to be a point of what you're saying, which is, look, you know, property is relatively black, black and white. Um, and of course, feeding into uh, key parts as much as you can um, that's ultimately what it comes down to but when we look at separating the Savills team versus the amateur mm -hmm. investor there's there's got to be a vast difference clearly in terms of the scale of your operation um, give us an insight into that yeah so we're very lucky so we are probably the largest re residential research team in the country so there's 30 of us in the UK wow. residential research team. So it's not just you in a, in a dark room? No, exactly. Yes. There's, there's a wide, wide yeah. uh, range of us, and that means that we have the ability to look across an awful lot of other data sets and mm. also have people with specialisms in different parts of the market. So we've got people who focus on the prime end, people who look after the wider like B2C part of the market, others who are specialists in development, investment, and other bits that mean you've got more minds to bring together to say, what does this data mean? And how do they link together? Because mm. there's an awful lot of data points that are useful to have, but don't necessarily tell the story unless they're pulled in to work with something else. Yes. Naturally, a lot of the information that you put out doesn't come for free. And you know, to assume that I can go online and research for a couple of hours could somewhat be mm. uh, misguided. How much money goes into the research element of, of your operation? We spend quite a lot of money on that and actually being a research team, data is a really important part of that. And we have numerous subscriptions to people like Zoopla, people like um, Experian, Oxford Economics, where we have access to data through that mm -hmm. that allows us to do things that you can't just do if you're Googling them yourself. Okay. Because we need that to do our wider consultancy work as well as really understand the market. I think that is one of the areas that differentiates the kind of bespoke research team mm -hmm. that we are in in a part of a part of a wider business versus any any person on the street doing their own thing and there will always be challenges but you can to a degree get some of that 
on your on your own. Yes. But it won't necessarily be to the depth and granularity that we're able to do because of the budget in which we spend on things. Naturally, and and for for buy today investors or investors at a, a very much a, an amateur level, um, are there tools that you'd recommend? Yeah, I think there's an awful lot of good data now coming out of places like the ONS mm -hmm. and other government departments that didn't exist even back when I started my career 10, 11 years ago, that the government's going to be much better at pushing out free open source data mm. that you're allowed to use and drill into that helps you get a grip on this. And just reading reading the reports that people put out and people like the Zoopla or Rightmove or us or our competitors put out and just reading up on what's going on and allowing you to kind of synthesize your own view based upon what you're seeing, I think is a really important part of looking at this. I have to admit, looking through data sometimes is like reading through a contract. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes I'm I have to sit there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Super fun. I sit there sometimes thinking, oh, my, my mind is frazzled here. How do you extract information from so many figures, so much information? Um, how would you start? So I think we always start thinking around what, what is the story you're trying to tell? Mm. You generally, when you're going into report, have a rough idea of where you're going, what you're looking to do. You then pull together relevant data sources and actually say we're doing a report on the rental market. We'll put together a kind of small slide pack that we'll discuss internally with the kind of key charts, some bullet point notes about what we think it means, and then sit and say, okay, what's the so what? because research is actually storytelling and the difference between a dull research report and a good research report is you actually feel like you're getting something out of it rather than just in the market, house prices are this, they've done this, they've done that, and then that's when you get the kind of monotonous, <laughs> I'm going to sleep now, rather than I will, how do you weave that through and to tell someone the story of what's happening while using the data to punctuate the points to give you the weight that someone knows that what you're saying is factual and credible, mm. but not getting so hung up on data point, data point, data point. Um, and yeah, they, that is a skill and it's something that we spend a lot of time working on as a team to understand how we can do it better and what we need to be doing. The landscape now mm -hmm. versus the landscape when you joined Savills in 2017. Um, what are the vast differences? So the, the biggest one is probably the availability of data now. Okay. Um, back when I joined in 2017, one of our USPs and strengths was an awful lot of the data that we had that others didn't. That's become more and more eroded over time. More people have access to the same level of data. So it's trying to find ways that you can set yourself apart mm. by doing more interesting things with that data or combining them in other ways or telling a more interesting story rather than just providing a factual update on this quarter, this has happened in this house. Mm. So the comp level of competition now, I think, is massively increased from when it was. Uh, looking at the attitude, specific specifically from an investor's point of view, um, have you sensed a change from their demands? Yeah, I think investors now are becoming more and more discerning and thinking more and more clearly around what they need to do and what they need to know. Mm. There's less and less of the, I will all be fine if I just buy this and rent it'll be it'll be okay right. there's a lot more caution yeah and also not more want to like understand what's going on i think especially the last couple of years with all of the kind of black swan events we've been having around pandemic lockdowns high like very high inflation mm. there's the realization that you need to be on top of the game and understand what's happening yeah and you can't just go out and do it alongside what the government has done to kind of curtail the buy to let market in ways that haven't been very helpful for supply mm. i think that has meant that those who are still in the market are professionalizing and becoming bigger landlords and understanding more of what's going on. So we want to have a better handle on the market rather than just a, one property is being rendered, that's fine, don't mm. worry about anything. The, the stakes are a lot higher, without a doubt. Um, and we stand by the fact that you know, property is a business. You don't just set up a business and hope for the best. You've, you've got to be meticulous in the planning from, from the get-go. Um, you touched on the supply. Mm. Hot topic, um, you know. The, the, there's there's so much about supply versus demand, and and why potentially the market hasn't performed as badly as what has been initially thought because there is a lack of supply, which I think is indisputable. Yeah, pretty much. Across every 
pretty much every market, the level of available supply in the market today is mm. lower than it was back in 2018 or 19. Fine. So that that's a fact. And but when we look at supply and the the, the rise of rents, you know, you've spoken about this before. Um, there's got to be a ceiling. There's got to be a cutoff. Can you explain that? In more detail yeah so for the last couple of years so as we came out of covid back 2021 onwards kind of that supply fell away mm -hmm. the demand level rocketed up and that meant that tenants were having to bid higher and higher to get access to properties amazing for landlords yeah so you had 18 months or so of double digit rental growth in vast majority of markets across the uk mm. which means that rents now are significantly higher than they were before we went into covid in march 2020 but now we're starting to see, especially in some of the more high value markets where you see this very strong rental growth, that you're hitting an affordability ceiling. There is only so much mm. a tenant is willing to pay or able to pay from their monthly pay packet to secure a property. Mm. So you are now starting to see the rate of growth slow in some of these markets and also demand moving to a different part of the market. So rippling out of in, inner London outwards. And actually, some of the strongest rental growth you're seeing at the moment is in places like Crawley and Harlow, where people have made that kind of jump mm. just across the M25 to somewhere I can still commute in, but I'm not paying the same rate I would have been to be living further in. How do you see that panning out for the rest of the year? So I think that dynamic is going to continue to play out. So we, there's no sign at the moment of an increase in supply coming down the pipeline. Okay. Like, with mortgage rates where they are, it's very difficult for a mortgage investor to come into the market. Mm. There's limited amount of people who have all equity to go and buy lots of assets. Mm -hmm. So that's not going to change in the near term. I think what you will see is that those more in-demand markets where rents have gone too much, rental growth will slow a bit during 2024. Okay. But in the broader market, we'll still outperform the kind of historical norms because that imbalance still exists. We're talking about particular markets, right? We're not talking about the entire market. No, it's, it's very much particular markets where you've got that kind of affordability barrier starting to come in. Mm. And it is those kind of more central London ones, or kind of inner London, where you've seen this ramp, very significant ramp rental growth in the last couple of years Fine. that now mean that people can't keep paying that much. Mm. So they are starting to move and move it further out. So displacing outwards a bit as a go. Yeah. But majority of the market is still running at seven, eight percent rental growth. Good speed. And and this is somewhat of a gripe that, that I have when, you know, we we sort of box the property market into one jar. It's not. It's hyper local. There's so many different sub markets, so many moving pieces. Mm -hmm. Um and it's important when you're carrying out your research to look at things on a more case by case basis. Yeah, definitely I think Whenever we're presenting on the market, so we you like Here, here's the UK picture, yeah. and then like I've all, I've always been a big fan of saying, well, UK like masks regional variations. So then you go down to regions, so London versus the northwest versus southwest. But then even within that, you know, well, Bristol's performing differently to Cornwall, mm. like Manchester performing differently to Cheshire. Like right? then within Manchester, well, this part of Manchester performing differently to that. So yeah. it's always about being being cognizant and careful not to overgeneralize that because this is happening on the wider piece means mm. that this will happen. And even in some of the marks we're seeing rental growth slowing, if you're at a lower price point where there is a deeper pool of demand, then you'll still see better rental growth than if you're right at the top of that mm. market where there's less people who can afford that. So even within those parts of the market is being cognizant and understanding of what is there and what you can do. A scenario for you, Richard. Um, I'm about to embark in into the world of property investment, mm -hmm. and you know I want to get started. Um, what are the simple steps that I could carry out, knowing that this isn't my full time job? Mm -hmm. How would you start? I would start by thinking, what is the area in which you want to invest in? So you'd focus, focus on I'd, a particular, I'd, yeah, particular I'd, I'd, location. I'd recommend focusing on an area and probably an area that you do know. Okay. Because I think it goes back to the discussion we were having earlier about the hyper-local part of the market. Like mm. If you're on the right part of the street, mm. then you know that's a more desirable part of the street than the one further down or one two streets over. Mm. So investing where you know is probably a better place to start. Rather what, if, than, what if where you know is, isn't a good area for investment? 
i.e. London, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, yeah. We talk about returns. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's not affordable to the masses. No, then in that case, then I'll find somewhere where you can go and walk the streets and get an understanding of the okay. price. I mean, you can do all the desktop research in the world, mm. but nothing replaces walking around True. the area and getting the feel for it. True. Um, even if you're only there for a day or an afternoon, right, we always try whenever we're doing some work to spend a bit of time and go to site mm. because walking from the train station or from the park or wherever it is, you just learn a lot more about somewhere than you do by sitting on Google Street View and pressing the button to go down I the road. Agree. Um, so I think that's the first part. And then it's then looking in that area you want to go on. Go on to places like Right Move and Supla, search for what is available and just see what appears to be the kind of market, what the properties are that people are looking for. Mm. Is this a market where it's mostly two, three bed houses or is it flats? Because if there's not many flats in the market, it might indicate that people don't really want to rent a flat in that location. Mm. It's more of a house market, so they want to, you want to try and find that type of property. So you're almost sort of working backwards to a certain extent. You're thinking about what you'd like to achieve, mm. um, who you'd like to target, and then start working from there. Yeah, because I think fundamentally you've got rental properties only going to be as good as the tenant or the customer you bring in. Yeah. So understanding who it is you're targeting, are you in a market where actually your better return is targeting a student mm. market? Or is it a young family market? Is it singles or couples? That seeing who your kind of tenant would be allows you to work back to think, well, what is it they need to have and what of that can I afford in my price brand or price range? I'm going to put you on the spot here and, and ask you about hotspots. You know, everyone's <laughs> after, you, know, you mentioned it earlier, location, 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 yeah. and it's, we get asked it all the time. Um, where, where are the locations that are showing some real promise uh, over the coming year or so? So I think one of the areas that I'd be looking at is that kind of commuter towns around big cities. Okay. So where is it that those who are priced out or don't want to live in the city centre, they want a house, not a flat, but they still need to be able to get into somewhere like Birmingham or into Bristol or into Manchester, et cetera. Mm. Those, I think, are the kind of markets where if you're looking for, say, like two or three bed houses, you could find a great opportunity to get them and have that like long-term demand because you're then linked into the growth of those local economies, but in a place where it's slightly more affordable for people to rent so you can have continued demand. I'm internally grinning here because it, you know we, we very much are on the same page, and it's almost like I've scored top marks <laughs> with my teacher. But you know, and and that that sort of feeds into the respect that people have mm. for Savills. But we we very much echo that. Um, when you're looking at these big cities, these big cities are hugely unaffordable to to the masses. Certainly, when you're trying to break into the market as an investor. So logically, you think, okay, well, there's there's going to be crumbs. Where are those crumbs yeah. going to fall? And it's those sort of secondary markets, those tertiary markets, yeah. um, and that is where we'd recommend investors sort of look at and, mm. and sort of plant some seeds. Um, so you won't name any specific locations, but you, you, <laughs> generally that's the rule of thumb. Yeah, I think I think that and that is kind of like a thesis sort of thought process of where to be looking mm. rather than being put on the spot and saying invest in this one location because I think that then gives you the flexibility to think well. What are those locations around Great. me that work, yeah. or that I know a bit more about, rather than saying, "Oh crap, I don't live anywhere near that. I can't mm. possibly go and do that." Yeah, true. And, and the truth is, I, I don't feel that there is a particular location that that they all have their merits. Yeah, um, you know, it's very rare that you find a bad location. There's some positive in everything, and it's all price relative. Mm. Um, you know, if if you are in a supposed worse location, you know, the price will reflect. Yeah. Um, so that's important to, to bear in mind. Now. With a lot of the data that you put out there, um, we've we've touched on when it goes right and when sometimes occasionally it might go wrong. Um, what's it like having that responsibility um, on your shoulders, being the head of of what what necessarily gets published and put out there? It's both. It's a it's a really nice positive reinforcement that we're doing the right job. That people respect what we're putting out. Mm. But obviously, we need to make sure that we are correct in what we're doing and that when we're looking at something we've triple checked things that are going out that the data we've used is being interpreted the right way and part of that i think is using the wider team that we have to say can you just read this and check that i'm not misinterpreting it or i haven't got something completely wrong Mm. and like sense checking yourselves and doing it and then just making sure that if something does go wrong you're putting your hand up and 
owning the fact that it has happened and not trying to brush it under the carpet and say, no, 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 it's fine. And just saying, look, look, cool, we got that wrong. We've changed it. This updates on the website. Here's a new document. And that people can then have that continued trust in us mm. to say what we're seeing and say something correct rather than fabricating things and putting things out that serve another ma another matter. Yeah, it, it's being potentially more agenda-based rather than more neutral, mm. um, and that's that's fair. Buy to let is very different to what it was last year, let alone five years, ten years. Um, there's a lot being spoken about energy performance mm. and properties and legislation and taxes. What are what are um, key points that are certainly things that should be taken into account when investors are buying property yeah. um, down the line? So, so I think there's two major things at the moment. The first one is the Renters Reform Bill, yeah. which is due to have a second reading in the House of Lords today. Okay. Uh, on its way, that Michael Gove is aiming to have it passed before the election. Mm -hmm. Could happen, depends on when they call the election. But I, understanding what that is and what that potential impact could be depending on what they do with section 21 the removal of no fault evictions and the need to put things through the courts could impact an investor's decision on what to buy and where and for for viewers watching um can we unpack the renters reform bill yeah so i think the main the main piece within that that people need to be aware of is this kind of push the kind of shift in direction of travel a bit more towards protection of tenants over the current market. Mm. So the move to creating a more secure tenure for those who are renting, and one of which is the kind of removal of the kind of no fault eviction route, yeah. which most landlords, almost all landlords are used in a way that it's supposed to be used for, but mm. there were always some bad apples in every market who are abusing what that is. So the main kind of shift we're seeing there is the government's plans to take that route to get your property back out of the market and mean you have to go through the property courts mm. they'll expand the kind of number of ways in which you can do that but the big challenge and what us and other people in the industry have been saying to government is that the court system isn't able to deal with that right now mm. it's already behind on all of the kind of cases that were brought forward during a post-covid there hasn't been the investment into the system to allow it to grow to meet the needs of what the market has. So if they push too quickly on that, it potentially creates backlogs and difficulties for landlords to secure vacant possession of their property. Got you. Okay, so renters reform bill is one. What, what else? And the other one, which you, which you mentioned, is that kind of minimum energy performance. Okay. So there were plans to bring that in and increase the minimum EPC rating of a property to a C. Mm. Uh, our analysis of the rental market looks around 55-ish percent of rental properties don't currently meet EPCC. Right. That was kicked down the, the can was kicked down the road about 18 months ago. Mm. But I think with us legally as a country signed up to net zero by 2050, it's going to have to come back. Yeah. And when we when we have an election, we probably end up with a new government that may well come back onto the agenda. So I think if you're looking at properties to be buying, being cognizant of what the EPC is now and what would need to be done mm. to get to that level, and do you have the capital, would you want to be doing that, is just building a little bit of security and insurance yourself to say that actually what you're doing will still be a viable investment in five years' time. This, this very much circles back to what you were saying, which is not necessarily having the blinkers on and thinking about the deal. Mm. It's think having one eye down the line and thinking, okay, what's happening with legislation? What's happening with the appetite and the climate mm. of the market? Um, and it, the EPCs and the energy performance of properties is super important. Richard, um, thanks so much for taking the time uh, to speak with us today. Um, I found it of use and, and certainly the, the viewers watching will have done so as well. Um, I think we've mentioned the most recent house price forecast. Um, we'll add the link in the description below. Um, thanks for your time. Hope you've enjoyed yourself. I have. Thank you very much for having me along. Pleasure. Uh, and as always, thanks for watching, guys, and uh, we'll see you on the next one.